God so well. Can we bring down heaven this morning? Woo, hallelujah. Amen. Lord, we worship you. We just love to sing songs of love, Lord. Praise and worship you. This is my surrender. This 
simply no room for the paralyzed man it was so crowded but the four friends make room and lower the paralyzed man through a roof the man get connected with Jesus and he was totally healed all because of the four friends that make room for Jesus praise the Lord amazing things happen when we make room for God situation that seems impossible becomes possible because there is nothing too hard for God I say there is nothing too hard for God and all it takes for you is to make room for him hallelujah all it takes is to make room for Jesus yes 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 As we worship God, let's take intentional steps to make room for God. Don't be paralyzed by your situation. Heaven is open when we make room for Him. Jesus, we come before you. Remove everything that has cluttered our mind, has cluttered our lives. We make space for you, Lord. Just lift up all the hands, make space for Him. Do not be paralyzed by your situation. In His presence, anything can happen. Just make room for Him. Just make room for Him. Just make space for Him. the Lord this morning 
Sunday morning service like what brother Paul has shared earlier on I just sense that the Lord is inviting us to draw closer to Him He's inviting us to dig deeper in Him don't be paralyzed by your situation by what you are facing today the Lord is with us and for us and like what Paul will remind us in Romans 12 verse 1 so what will you now give beloved friends what is the proper response to God's marvelous mercies the proper response is to surrender ourselves as sacred living sacrifices Sunday service this morning where we present ourselves as a living sacrifice and say Lord here I am I come before you and I choose to stand in faith to be holy to turn away from sin and turn to you Jesus this morning when we say, Lord, I believe, come and have your way in me. Come and have your way in me. And today that is your cry. Shall we just lift up our hands and just pray the Spirit. That's right, this morning, let's renew our love and our commitment to the Lord once again. Come and do a work in us, oh God. walking around life and we place it on the altar as an offering Lord we make room for you in our heart in our minds in our lives in our marriage in our families Jesus we make room for you in our studies in our careers in our finances we make room for you in every dimension of our lives and Lord this morning we fix our attention on you God change us on the inside out let us bring great delight to you jesus we want to glorify you with our lives this morning we come before you and lord we say let your name be glorified in our lives as we make room for you jesus hallelujah that's right give jesus a big hand hallelujah that's right give jesus the highest praise his body we make room you this morning. We make room for you in our service. We make room for you in our lives. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Wow, how many of you can really sense the presence of God here? Hallelujah. I know before you are seated, 
Help me turn to your neighbors or your right and left and tell them, Jesus loves you and I love you too. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Welcome. Welcome to our Sunday 10 a.m. service. This is the most exciting place you can be in on a Sunday morning service. Yeah, in a in a um, in Sea Harvest Church, we love to welcome our friends. All right, so if you are here for the first time, for the second time, you are our VIP, and I want to invite you at a count of three to stand out on your feet and church. Let's warmly welcome them. Are you ready? One, two, three. That's right. If you are here for the first time, second time, we want to welcome you to Sea Harvest Church. Just remain standing. Our ushers would like to hand you our welcome card. And in it, there's a QR code. You can scan it. There's a, some special content for you. And right after the service, don't be in a hurry to rush back. Okay, instead, you can head to our VIP lounge, which is in Hall 605, the hall on your left. Our greeters will love to connect with you. So once again, welcome to Sea Harvest Church. Right now, let's prepare our hearts to give to the Lord. Amen. Welcome to City Harvest. And welcome to church this morning. What a wonderful presence of God here in this place. And right now, we just want to prepare our hearts to give to God our tithes and our offering this morning. Well, this morning, as before we give to the Lord, we want to really look at Jesus as the model for our giving. You know, many of the things that we all have learned and now do, whether is it habits, behaviors, or activities, they are really foundationally known as the modeled activities. For example, children, they often model themselves after their parents. They talk, they dress, they think like how their parents would. When we say we model after someone, it means we are trying to be like and to behave like the person, especially one whom we love and we admire. I want to read to all of us here in John chapter 5, 19 to 20. It says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. You see, Jesus himself modeled his activities after God, his Father. So all of us here as believers, we want to be more Christ-like. So we want to model after Jesus, even in the area of giving. Let's see how Jesus gave so that we can model after him. Firstly, we know Jesus gave willingly. Willingness is based on surrender. When Jesus gave his life for you and me, he willingly surrendered himself to the, to, to the Lord. He said, not my will, but yours be done. So when we say we give our offerings to God as a gift, it must first be a gift that is given willingly because a gift can only be a gift if it is given willingly. How else did Jesus give? Well, Jesus gave joyfully. And joyfulness is based on gratefulness. We cannot give joyfully if we think what we have is just ours. All we have really belongs to God. And the Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful and a joyful giver. Thirdly, Jesus gave sacrificially. And we all know that sacrifice is based on love. Our generosity in giving should model Jesus' selflessness and love is often expressed in our sacrifice and in our giving. And when we talk about sacrifice, really it is not about the equality of the amount, but it is the equality of the surrender in our surrendering to Him. So church, Jesus gave to all of us willingly, joyfully, and sacrificially. It's based on surrender, gratefulness, and love. Shall we get ready our tithes and our offerings this morning? Because as we give to Him, we want to model how Jesus gave. And we, with that, with the willingness, the joyfulness, and the gratefulness, let's give to the Lord. Amen? On the screen, you can all see the various modes of giving. You may give by cash. You may give by credit card. You may also scan the QR code on the screen or on the seats in front of you. 
our offering envelopes are also available. So if you need an offering envelope, just kindly raise your hands and our friendly ushers are just all around and they will pass to you one. Are you ready to give to the Lord this morning? Amen. Shall we just look to the Lord in prayer? Father, we just want to thank you for your presence this morning. Indeed, O oh God, we want to make room for you as we give to you this morning our tithes, our offerings. We want to give to you willingly. We want to give you joyfully and sacrificially. May you take delight in our giving. And as we give to you, I pray that you bless all my brothers and sisters here in this place. Let heaven be so open in every one of their lives. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. Thank you so much for giving to the Lord this morning. As the ushers start passing the offering buckets down each row, if you're giving by cash, remember to put your offering envelope into the bucket. Those of you who are watching us online, thank you so much for giving faithfully and generously. You can also participate in this giving too. How many of you are still happy in this place? Amen. Let's get, some, let's get ready for some announcement before we are in for a good treat this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Audrey. Hi, church. I'm here to give you uh, announcements, three very short announcements. First up, due to the external event happening in our main hall, our services will be held in Hall 606 Theatre on 4th and the 5th of May. Now, to accommodate our congregation, we'll be having five services. Now, on Saturday, 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and 6 p.m., and on Sunday, 9.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. Nursery and Harvest Kids will be available for all services, and our Chinese service congregation will be having their services at Jurong West B4 Main Auditorium at 10 a.m. on 5th of May on Sunday. Now, if you're in a cell group, please check with your cell group leader which specific service your cell group is encouraged to attend. Now, do note that Saturday, 4 p.m. and Sunday, 9.30 a.m., those are the hot ones, okay? So, we are ready for our capacity crowd. So, if you want to come for that, come nice and early or consider attending other service timings. Now, church, we are deeply thankful for your patience, your understanding, your love, especially towards our ushers and security volunteers. Can we just give all the ushers and security volunteers a big round of applause, yeah? Awesome. We love them. We love them so much, yeah? So, help me turn to your neighbour on your left or right. Tell them, see you at multiple services. The second announcement is our first baby dedication. This year will be held on 25th and 26th of May during our weekend services. Now, if your baby is 24 months and below as of May 2024, you may sign up via chc.org.sg slash baby dedication or via the CHC website or the CHC app. Now, you will also need to attend a baby dedication class on the 8th of May on Wednesday at 8 p.m. via Zoom. So this class is for parents to learn the significance of baby, de 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 baby dedication. Registration closes on the 12th of May. And on to my last and final announcement. Your very own Christian radio station, City Radio, turns 13. Join us for our Instagram contest by performing a duet of any Christian song of your choice. But the duet must be performed by a guy and a girl. Alright, guy and girl, alright? So just follow these three simple steps. Record a one-minute video in portrait mode of you performing a duet of any Christian song, I said it, guy and girl. Next thing, you email the video to contest at cdradio.sg with your Instagram handle as well as your name. And lastly, tell us why you chose the song. Be as creative as possible. And closing date for submission is on the 26th of May. Now, we will be giving away a Roland keyboard and Martin acoustic guitar signed by both Amanda Cook and Leland. And details are on CD Radio's Instagram. Now, church, this one famous for tomorrow, okay, Monday. Please, uh, City Radio's Instagram page on Monday, we are also giving away a kahong signed by Leland and Amanda Cook. So the details are on our Instagram page. Thank you so much, Church, for your love and support for your very own Christian radio station. Thank you very much. Praise God. Why don't we just give a big clap to Bernard. 13 years, City Radio. Amazing. Thank you, Ben. Praise the Lord. Now, um, this morning, we want to pray for Pastor Aris's mom. Aris, just come and take a mic and just come and share because uh, mom was hospitalized a week ago. Last Sunday, we prayed. And just give us an update so that we can pray again. Uh, yes, Pastor. Thank you so much, Church, for praying for me and, of course, for my mom. 
And uh, basically, uh, my mom is still not out of the woods. Mm. She's still in ICU. And um, just last night, uh, I received an update. Uh, the situation um, is not uh, progressing or improving well. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, I covered your prayers. And uh, like what I told Pastor this morning, uh, I still may have to go back um, just in case, uh, you know, if the situation continue to uh, yeah. deteriorate. Yeah. But in, in any way, um, since day one, she actually has improved, Pastor, yeah. uh, drastically. But because of her age and the condition, yeah. uh, the infection starts to spread yeah. a little bit and uh, her body was a little bit weak to fight it off. Yeah. So, how that's why we need to pray. How old is mommy? Uh, 83 years old, Pastor. 83. Yeah, that's, 83. That's not too old. You know? Yeah, 83 yeah. and... Uh, she has pneumonia now, right? Uh, at this moment, she has mild pneumonia. Mild pneumonia. Yeah, but um, the body it was not, it's not able to fight off this pneumonia yeah. at this moment. Yeah. yeah, at this moment. So, I told Pastor Aris, if you need to go back, just go back because family's first, right? Yes. And we just really got to pray for mom. Why don't we just all stand up right now? Pastor Eileen, can you just take a mic? Can you all stretch your hands towards Pastor Aris? Let's just begin to pray for him right now. Let's open our mouth and pray in tongues. Shuturia la carabaha dadia la carabaha dadia la carabaha dadia la carabaha dadia Father, we thank you, O oh God, that this morning we can come once again, O oh God. Yes, Truly, Lord. this is a place of power because this is a place of agreement. Lord, yes, we agree Lord. together for Pastor Ari's mom, Lord, to be well, to be healed, Lord. Say in your word, O oh God, that we can pour all our anxiety and all our stress yes, on you, Lord, upon you because Lord, we can leave, Lord, we can leave them all there you care for us you love us so much oh God so I pray for mom right now that where she is Lord she will experience shalom peace she will experience oh God a comfort that's beyond oh God what men can give oh God father she will have a seed of faith inside of her that she will get well she will improve oh God day by day father we pray for recovery right now pray for her kidney pray for her organs pray for her trouble side Lord to be of the right level right now in Jesus name we pray oh God that you increase oh God father that the toxin be gone and the increase the triple sight in her body oh God that she can fight against any kind of infection oh God we pray for strength to come upon her right now bless the Lord oh my soul and all that's within us bless his holy name Lord we declare oh God that you are here mom God will give mom good things Lord and Lord that she will stay in good health Lord she will have strength Lord she will be renewed strength as like eager, Lord. Father, we pray for renewing strength to come upon her. And we pray for Pastor Aris and the entire family for that. Lord, for the brother. Lord, as they, as they come around them, oh God. Father, I pray for grace upon grace, Lord, in this season. That they will be lifted up, Lord God, by the grace of God. We thank you, oh God, for salvation. We thank you for total recovery. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Let's thank the Lord for the victory in advance. Thank the Lord for the healing in advance. Thank the Lord for resuscitation, for restoration, for recovery in advance. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for praying. Please be seated right now. I only have one an other announcement this morning. Next weekend, Dr. David Samra will be preaching in our English services. Now, David Samaral is the grandnephew of Dr. Lester Samaral, one of the most famous missionary statesmen of the 20th century. Now, Pastor David has been the senior pastor of Cathedral of Praise in Manila for over 40 years. Now, COP is a huge mega church with branches all across the Philippines and around the world. So this is the first time Pastor David is preaching in our main services. The last time the grand uncle came was in the 1990s when we were at Westin Hotel. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's good to have his, uh, one of his posterities back here ministering to us. So I know you're in for a great time. Will you turn to your neighbors on your left and right and say, get ready for a blessed time next week. Uh, yeah. This morning, we're so blessed to have Professor Doug Peterson and Sister Myrna back with us in our church. Yeah, amen. Praise God. Yeah. Prof has been busy teaching Old Testament survey the whole week at the SOT. So many texted me and told me that they were so touched by his teaching. Prof has been such a great blessing to our church. Bring all the global scholars here, helping us with our SOT. Now, from this year, all our programs will be globally recognized. From the SOT diploma 
to the Bachelor of Theology, and to the brand new Master of Arts in Theology. So from this October, we'll be starting our Master's program, globally recognized. All these are not possible mainly because of Prof. Da. He's the one attracting all the global professors and scholars to come and teach in SOT and to come and minister in our church. Shall we all stand up right now? Now, those of you who are not familiar with Prof, he's a distinguished professor of social theology. 44 years ago, Prof and Sister Myrna started Latin America childcare, the largest childcare in the world, ministering to the poorest of the poor. In four decades, they started 300 schools in 22 countries, all throughout Central America, Caribbean, and South America. His ministry has provided education for more than 2 million children. More than 2 million children. And every day, even now, even after he has retired, he's, it is still feeding 100,000 kids every day. Come on, let us give a big clap. Let's welcome Professor Doug Peterson. Thank you. Thank you so much. My kids say, Dad, that church is great for your self esteem. <laughs> Please be seated. You know, I just love the worship. I mean, the worship is just wonderful from the choir. In fact, I watch every week on YouTube, and they just have the joy of the Lord on their faces and all the musicians. So there's a lot of nights when, before I go to sleep, I'll get my earbuds, and I'll go to YouTube and get a good long worship segment, turn it up as loud as I want, and fall asleep. And I did that last night. Um, and I do often do that. It is just so marvelous. And it is so good to be with you. It is so good to be with you. Um, this church has, has just blessed us and really carried us through this past year. Wasn't going to do this, but I will. Um, three or four Sundays ago, you had a healing service. And the worship team would sing over and over at the end, I am the Lord that healeth you. And um, I'm watching, it was a Sunday morning, and I don't usually feel sorry for myself. But I remember I put my hands on my eyes and prayed for myself, and, which I've done a thousand times. And I stopped to think, what are the things I've lost? I've lost my independence. Um, can't go anywhere by myself. I can't read my books. I am completely dependent on others. And for the first time in the year, I just sort of broke. And I felt a tear running down. And then you get a hold of yourself. And I thought of... What are all the things that I have? I have a wonderful family. I have a church who, who really loves me. I have a pastor who cares about me. And I have a third career. Who has a third career? People don't have a second career. Just a few days before I came, I wrote a letter of retirement to the university where I've been there for longer than most of you have been alive. And um, I, I wasn't planning on retiring. What I was planning to do was just be able to shift my interests to um, putting my assets at the service of City Harvest Church and the goal of making theology come alive in a church and in, a, in Asia. It is just a, a wonderful opportunity because the church has the capacity to be at the point of the spear 
and to allow what's happening in here to spread outside, you need a, a great faculty of Pentecostals. You need something that's accessible that people can get from wherever they are, and it needs to be affordable, which usually theological education isn't. And it needs to be linked to the local church. And that is the possibility we have. Um, City Harvest Church is like a machine. And it can just spread out. It has that kind of influence. When you think about it, SOT already has about 650 students. Um, soon we'll have 1,000. And that is like cannot happen. But it does. And so I started thinking those three Sundays ago, the lines indeed, as the psalmist has said, have fallen for me in very pleasant places. And I am so grateful. Myrna did say to me, Doug, don't tell anybody about any more of our infirmities or they'll think we're the neediest people on earth. <laughs> or they'll think we're just two old people falling apart. Um, I said, Myrna, don't worry. Asians are culturally obligated to respect the elderly. <laughs> Which is just wonderful. I want to speak today about a story that's too wonderful for words. It's one that should catch us up in awe where we don't forget how we came, became a part of the family of God and what that means for us. And if you've come in to the church today and you're not part of the family, what a wonderful opportunity to hear some of the greatest news you could possibly imagine. So I want to do two parables and they, they only cover three verses. So I'm going to have a long introduction to what I think will be a very short sermon, I think. Um, I remember my first sermon when I said that, about very short. I was 18, and it was my home church. Hardest place in the world to preach. It's just small, and everybody knows who you are. And I had never preached before, and I had worked on this sermon. I had, I had preached it out loud. I had timed it, so it wouldn't be too short, it wouldn't be too long. And, but I had forgotten that when you're nervous, it's like you just fly. And I preached that whole sermon, 12 minutes. Can you imagine the situation a pastor's in? He wants to be gracious. He doesn't want you to feel bad. But he can't let people go after 12 minutes. <laughs> so he sang a couple songs and came up with some way of tying whatever I said to what he was going to say so it makes sense. Uh, but that was probably the last short sermon I ever preached. So, um, but I think it will be. For these parables, these two parables, one's on the treasure in the field and the other's the pearl of great price, to make any sense, we need to understand what Jesus meant when he talked about the kingdom of God. Because his parables would begin like that. The kingdom of God is life. And he'd tell a parable. Mark's gospel opens the best for us in that Mark opens with a bang. There's no birth narrative. There's nothing about Jesus growing up. Nothing about his family. There's his baptism, John baptism. And then, verse 14, Jesus comes preaching through Galilee, proclaiming, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. People go wild. He sends out his disciples. And he tells them, go from village to village, and I give you authority to heal the sick and cast out the devil and preach the good news of the kingdom. People were 
beyond themselves. They couldn't get enough of Jesus. They would crowd in everywhere. It, the scripture says he would have to move out from the city to an outlying region, and they'd come there. The crowds were coming, and, and Mark records the miracles that would happen. That first chapter, the second chapter, the third chapter, one miracle after another. For the poor, there'd be a miracle. The leper would be cleansed. The lame would walk. The dead would be raised from the dead. People were beside themselves. What did they know that we as moderns miss? When you read that phrase, time is fulfilled, kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news, we just keep on going. What was it that caused such enthusiastic uproar? It comes from the Old Testament. Something all of the people know that we often don't. There was a perspective of a Messiah in the prophets. And they believed that there was a great day coming. They called it the day of the Lord. And when that time was fulfilled, the day of the Lord would take place. On one side is oppression and pain and hurt and suffering and sickness and demon. On the other side of the day of the Lord was blessing and freedom and healing and a new kingdom that practically run like utopia. They expected that a Messiah would break into human history and set up a kingdom. Sort of like David. David was the high point in Israel. The difference between David and the Messiah is that the Messiah was divine. And so that was the prophetic hope. That's what everybody expected. The kingdom is fulfilled this time that people have been waiting for. The kingdom is here and Jesus is doing all the signs of the kingdom. Everybody knew the Isaiah passage in Isaiah 61 where Isaiah prophesies, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news. The blind see, the poor are set free, the captives are set free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It was exciting. Jesus goes into the synagogue and traditionally somebody would read the scrolls out of the Old Testament. It would be like every week and it would be like liturgical. And Jesus reads. Luke records for us the reading. He picks it up. At the reading is based on Isaiah 61. Everybody's heard this over and over. But Jesus reads it, Luke 4, and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He is anointing me to preach good news. The blind see, the poor are set free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Everybody's heard that. Maybe three times a year for hundreds of years. But... Jesus sits down, and then he says, today, these words have been fulfilled in your presence. I am the Messiah. The kingdom has come present. What everybody expected, and here's Jesus out fulfilling all these signs everywhere he goes. John the Baptist's disciples, John's in prison. He's ready to be executed. And John's not afraid of anything, but he's apprehensive about how is this kingdom working? His disciples come to him and say, John, do you know all the things that Jesus is doing? The lame walk, the blind see. People are being raised from the dead. It is absolutely marvelous. But John thinks there is something missing. Because here is Jesus out doing all these signs of the kingdom, but nothing is changing. The Romans are still there. The oppression is still there. People are still under the thumb. There is no new kingdom, just all these miracles, but no new kingdom. And that is not what the prophets prophesied. 
So he says to his disciples, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and talk to Jesus and ask him, are you the one or should we wait for another? There's no coincidences in scripture. It's recorded that as the disciples came close to Jesus, just as they arrived, they saw the lame being healed. The blind could see. They said to Jesus, are you the one? John wants to know, are you the one or should we wait for another? Jesus said, just go tell John what you have seen and heard. I am the Messiah. That's all John needed. The kingdom of God had broken into the present with all of its power. The time was fulfilled. The day of the Lord had come. And Jesus inaugurates the kingdom. That's a visitation of heaven that just floods onto earth and it changes us in a moment. It is powerful. It is not just sort of come and we just get a little taste. God's rule, God's reign is broken into the present. And miracles happen. All the signs are there. We are transformed. Society is left alone. But it is present. But when Jesus talked about the time is fulfilled, he also was thinking about another period, and that is hundreds of years after the prophets, Jesus, there was no Messiah. And they lost hope in a Messiah who would break into history. And the, then the expectation became a Messiah will come. But he won't set up a kingdom. Time will be no more. It'll be the end of the age. So they had this age and the age to come. And the day of the Lord was after this age. But when the day of the Lord hit and the age to come was no more. Our idea of the second coming. Jesus had that in mind, and so when he referred to the time is fulfilled, he's referring to it has come present. It is now. But as he would teach his disciples and people who listened, it is still another stage. We're waiting for the not yet. The not yet. And he has all kinds of parables. Watch, wait, be ready. Don't let your torches go out. There's a date cake coming. You'll be held accountable. What about the banquet, the great banquet? Parable after parable about something that is going to be cataclysmic in the future, the not yet. So when Jesus is referring to the time is fulfilled, he's referring to both of those. The kingdom of God has come present with all of its power, but it comes quietly, invisibly, into the hearts of men and women and children and changes them, transforms them. But we're waiting for the not yet for that great day when every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. So Jesus says, repent. The kingdom requires a response. This visitation of God's reign that is like eschatologically, that's a big word. It's about what happens in the future spiritually has invaded human history and we are transformed. It requires a decision. I want to focus on the present. When this kingdom comes, it is so powerful. The scripture tells it when you press against it. It comes so dramatically, it's almost like violence. And you were changed in a moment. There's something powerful about this. It's like we are marching towards the future, which we are. We don't go in circles. What we believe, we go straight ahead to the future. But Jesus says, the kingdom is marching towards us. And when that kingdom, that rule of God, connects with our world, then they collide. 
transformation takes place. It is a miracle. It is marvelous. In this hot weather that I think you have all year round, um, if you take the plastic water bottle and you go outside and the water is cold, you will see that it will bead up and the beads will come out. That's like the kingdom. When you are touched with just a bead of the future, it transforms you, makes you a new creature. Just think about it. You were not the people you were. There isn't anything that's about you. Your life is organized around what you have heard and seen and experienced. But there's pain and there's still sorrow and there's still hurt. We're waiting for the not yet. One of the great examples is by a German theologian. His name was Oscar Kuhlman. And he wrote a book called Christ in Time. And in there he's got this great example about the now and the not yet. He used this D-Day, June 6, 1944, of World War II. And if you follow World War II at all, you know that's the only date that matters. You probably can't remember when it started, when it ended. June 6, 1944 is the important date. Before June 6, on June 5th, the Allies have no idea who's going to win the war. And the Axis troops don't know who's going to win. It's almost like a stalemate. The Allies are going to, on June 6, Eisenhower is going to send them across the English Channel and to storm the beaches of Normandy. But a problem, the Axis troops have got those all blocked off with, with gunners and piles and everything you could imagine. Nobody knows who's going to win. The morning of June 6, Eisenhower, he is hoping, he's praying, but he doesn't know. History shows us that he wrote a letter that he kept in his inner pocket to be read if the, vis if the mission failed. It was, I have sent our forces and they have been overthrown. The mission has failed. I chose the time, I chose the place. The fault is mine and mine alone. But he didn't have to send that letter. Because by three o'clock in the afternoon, everybody knew who was gonna win. The Allies had stormed the beaches of Normandy. And there was no question, the Allies knew they were gonna win, Axis troops knew they were gonna lose, but the war went on. It was brutal. In the next 11 months, more people died than in the rest of the war. But it wasn't at stake anymore. Kuhlman says we have a, a D-Day in our history. We have a June 6, 1944 in our history when Jesus broke into the present and his kingdom come, came and he overcame the enemy. He conquered death and the grave. But Kuhlman says, everybody knows who wins. We know. The enemy knows. But we're waiting for that not yet when it's over. But he says, here's the thing. We know we win. The devil can kill us, but he can't get us. We win. The now and the not yet. So that's my introduction, my long introduction to short. When Jesus' disciples would, they'd ask him, what's the kingdom like? What is it like? And Jesus would often respond with a parable. In fact, a third of Jesus' teachings is about the parables. And if you note know, when you read them carefully, they'll begin in response to a question, and Jesus will say, the kingdom of God is like. That's how he starts the two parables. This story that's too wonderful for words. The parable of the treasure in the field takes one verse. The backstory is that 
People in Israel, first century and prior, would often be carried off into exile. Something terrible would happen, and they wanted to keep their assets. So they would bury them, and they would know where it was, but nobody else would. They know it's 100 meters to the tree, and 50 meters in this direction, 25 meters in the other. Nobody could find it. In fact, when the Romans invaded, they knew about the Jews burying their treasures, and they dug up Israel, trying to find as many as they could, which they did. That's the story here. A man is out in the field, and he's working. He's cultivating, and accidentally, something he had never planned, he finds a treasure in the field. He cannot believe his good fortune. He cannot imagine. He goes, the scripture says, and buys the field, comes back. It costs him everything he has to buy that field. But he comes back and claims this treasure, and he believes this is the greatest thing that could ever happen. It cost him everything. But look what he has. Jesus says that's what the kingdom of God is like. How many of you found the Lord by pure accident? You weren't looking, you weren't expecting, you weren't seeking, just you found them. Somebody invited you to church, you weren't even really that interested, but you wanted to be nice, or your mother wanted you to come for Easter, or a friend. I had one of the members of the leadership group, I asked them how they came to know the Lord, and they said, well, a friend had been talking to them. So they thought they'd just come check it out, and they found the treasure in the field. If you've come this morning and you don't know the Lord, this is a story too wonderful for words. Jesus says the kingdom, that eschatological rule of heaven has burst in and can change you in a moment whether you're looking for him or not. My parents found the Lord by accident. The treasure in the field. My parents were in their 40s. People don't usually get saved in their 40s. And my, I'm sure my parents were good people. I was just a little boy at this point. I'm sure they were good people, but they absolutely never thought about God. My mother had only been inside of a church for a wedding or a funeral. My father, growing up, had gone to the state church in Denmark, but he'd never had an experience or thought about it. And when he came to Canada, he never thought about it again. None of the extended family, not one person, was saved. So there was no conversations. They had given it no thought. My father was a, a coal miner. and. He had some problems, like everybody does, with the coal mines, and he, we moved to a little area, maybe 50 miles away, and rented a little farm. That's where I grew up. Every Saturday, farmers would go into the town. It was a town maybe of two or 3,000 people. It had one main street, and they would get groceries or do whatever, and by noon ready, they go back home. My parents went on this Saturday morning and they did whatever they were going to do, got in the car and my dad started to back up and a man knocked on the window of their car. He introduced himself as a new pastor in town and he invited them to come to a campaign. This is just random. He's just talking to people at random. I'm not even sure I'm comfortable with that kind of evangelism, where it's like you're just accosting people. But he talked to my parents, and only the spirit. They went. My dad got, my dad got saved the first night, my mother the second, and everything changed. The treasure 
in the field. The story that is too wonderful for words. From that day, the Peterson family was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, and Friday night. Not even the pastor's kids had to go on Tuesday night (laughs) prayer meeting, and they lived there. I had to go. I can't remember not one time in all the years, blizzards or otherwise, where my parents said, why don't we just stay home tonight? Never happened, ever. We went to church. This is how strong this was. I'm, I'm 16, you can't miss church and you can't miss Sunday night. But the Beatles are gonna be on Ed Sullivan. And I'm thinking the whole world is gonna watch this show and my parents don't even know who they are. And if they did, they would never let me watch it. That's probably of the devil. But it was a Sunday night. And I thought, I have to see it. So I had a sudden illness. (laughs) And I told my mother, I'm just not feeling well. And I watched the Beatles and I just prayed, let this show be over before my folks get home. (laughs) And all of a sudden I was all better again. My parents were devout. I think about it, and as I look back, and I know this, the pastor and his wife, they were like a dual pastors, one for each in the morning, one at night, and then they switch around the next week. I thank my parents for their own converts in 12 years. And they shepherded my parents. You know, when we look back, and we're all number counters, and we look back, and if we were to measure their success, we would think, not successful, but we need the long view. I look back and you see it from my perspective and what changed my parents' life, changed my life, changed my kids' life, and probably had something to do with the lives of two million kids. Never despise the day of small things. Years went by, maybe 35 years. My father had passed away. We were living in Central America, and so we went home, we're Canadians, went home to Canada for the funeral. And after the funeral, we went to our home for the last time. Myrna and I were sitting there and my mother, and my mother said, I need to tell you a story. A story I've never told you before, but you need to know it before I go to heaven. She told me the most amazing story. Shortly after they were saved, she had what she called a vision or a dream. And it was all these, my mother's words, all these little brown kids filling the street right up onto the porch of the house. And she thought, God must want us to be missionaries. She calls up the pastor. They drive out. And there was no chance God was calling my parents to be missionaries. And the pastor knows that. But he's gracious. And just prayed with them, went back to town. My mother had it again. She calls the pastor. He comes out. And the third time, It was my dad. Pastor comes out the third time and he says, I know what it's about. Have you ever heard the story of Abraham and Isaac? They said, no, they they hadn't. He said, he told them the story. And he says, here is what your dream or your vision is about. It will be fulfilled through your son if you lay him on the altar, give him to the Lord. That vision will come true through your son. And so, my mother said, when you started this ministry, it was just for us something the Lord had told us many years before when you were just three or four years old. (laughs) 
And she said, we didn't want to make it happen. So by this time, we probably had 65,000 kids. And so she says, but you need to know that story before I go to heaven. News too wonderful for words. And it just keeps paying forward, paying forward, paying forward. And then here's one that is way less dramatic, but pure accident. During the global summit, one of the presenters was a Latin American pastor. His name was Juan Angel Castro. And he was doing a paper on violence because he was in El Salvador and there was like 40 straight years of terrible violence. And one and I started about the same time. I was probably 30 and he was 20. He had just gotten saved when I met him and he was a university student. But just prior to that, like all university students, civil war had started and they had to make a decision as to whose side they were on. El Salvador had had injustice for 200 years. Most of the university students joined the insurgency in the mountains, which is what Juan Angel was leaning towards. But then something happened. He loved soccer. Like every Latin kid, every Latin adult, they played in their lunchtime, even if they're 40 years old. They loved soccer. Somebody told him there was a church that had a soccer league. You're good enough to make it. The only hitch is you have to go to church. <laughs> and he thought, well, that was a small sacrifice to pay. So he joined the team. And he said when he, he went to church and he really did enjoy the music and the way they all were so loving between them, that fellowship, but he gave it no more thought than that. He said about eight months of this and he goes one night and the coach tells him, we're going evangelizing tonight. One on hill has no idea what evangelizing even means. But he wants to stay on the team. So the coach says, here's what we're going to do. And he gives everybody a track with the four spiritual laws. And he tells them, go find somebody, find out if they want to talk about the Lord. And if they do, share with them the four spiritual laws. One on hill never heard of the four spiritual laws, but he had the track. So he goes out and he's in front of the supermarket and there's like these three men who are hanging around trying to carry groceries for somebody and earn a little bit of money. And he goes up to them, asks them, do you want to talk about God? Yeah, they would. So he gets out the track and he reads them the four spiritual laws from the track. And it says, ask them if they'd like to pray. So, would you like to pray? And it said, get them to kneel. So kneel down. And say with them the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer was written out. So, he starts on the sinner's prayer. He gets about halfway through. And he realizes, I need to get saved. And he gets saved while he's reading the sinner's prayer for other people. That's what you call finding the treasure in the field by complete accident. But one hand on hill told me that transformation was dramatic. He couldn't stop talking about Jesus to everybody. He dropped out of university, went to Bible school got involved as a pastor, and when he was with us during the Global Summit for a number of years, he has pastored the Pentecostal church that's the flagship Pentecostal church, Jamaica church in El Salvador for years, completely by accident. How'd you find the Lord? Then Jesus said, there's another way. And he tells the story of a merchant. He goes to find a pearl. 
He wants exactly the right one. He is now seeking. He's not looking for something that's by accident. He is seeking. And one day, he comes across the pearl that is perfect. Jesus says he's got to have that pearl. He asks how much it is. They tell him it will cost him everything. But he cannot wait to pay it so he can have the pearl of great price. Jesus says, that's what the kingdom of God is like. You are searching everywhere. You are trying to find some answer to the mess that is in your life. And you go on, you try this, you try that, you try that, you're still just empty as can be. That may be how you came this morning. You were hoping when you got here something good would happen. You didn't know what. And for many of you, you can reflect back. That's how I found the Lord. And celebrate this news that's too wonderful for words. One more story. This one is also from one on him. He wrote up his paper and I was helping him. He used to be a grad student of mine, so I was helping him. And I came across his, I told him to write his own story. That's where I got the one about him getting saved while the others are getting saved. And he writes a story about a gang member, Nestor. After the Civil War, which went on for more than 10 years, young people were just without any kind of cover, and the gangs began to emerge, and they got worse and worse. These gangs became world famous because they were so brutal. They had tattoos all over. So when people saw them, just the tattoos all over would scare people. They held the city as a hostage. Every business had to pay them. If they didn't pay them, they'd shoot them. People were afraid to be out after dark. Complete mess. There were 6,000 of them and they controlled life. Their weapons were more powerful than anything actually the military had. One of the leaders of one of the main gangs was someone, his name was Nestor. Nestor was making a ton of money from drug sales and from this holding up people and getting money and businesses He's feeling pretty good. He's high up in the food chain. One afternoon, he's out in his community, I guess, and a little Pentecostal pastor, or Pentecostal pastor of a little church, must have had a lot of courage, came to Nestor and said, I want to talk to you about God. I can tell you a story that will get you out of the gangs. It will mean you don't have to look over your shoulder for anything bad that will happen. You'll be a new person. And the pastor prophesied. He said to Nestor, I am saying God wants you to be a preacher of the gospel. You become a pastor. For Nestor, this is just... He said he was polite, but he forgot about it immediately. He thought he was absolutely protected, that no one would try to get to him. He had all his lieutenants, and he was powerful. It would just be risky for somebody else. But another rival gang put a hit on Nestor. They wormed into his own gang and to the person he trusted the most. Paid him a lot of money to kill Nestor. And one day, this most loyal lieutenant shot Nestor five times. One bullet punctured the lung, another the intestine. Blood was all over. By the time they got Nestor to the hospital and the infection, and he had slipped into a coma, nobody expected him to live. For two or three days, he's in this coma. He's hanging on, but 
nothing more. And a lady doctor comes in. Nestor's in a coma, and she starts to pray for him. She takes him by the hand and says, Nestor, if you can believe in God, he will bring you out of this. If you can hear me, squeeze my hand. Nestor doesn't remember, but the doctor said Nestor squeezed her hand. Within an hour, he came out of the coma. He healed miraculously. And he was ready to be released. So he gets to the door of the hospital and he's released. But bad news, the police are there. They arrest him, send him to prison for his crimes. Nestor said when he got to the prison, he remembered this pastor. And he said, I accepted the Lord as my savior in prison and it broke me. I cried like a baby but it changed the way I saw everything. So I immediately started studying to be a pastor. Other gang members who knew who I was, because the whole prison was gang members, knew who I was, how afraid they would be of me, saw this dramatic change and would come and wonder, what have you experienced and can we experience? And he said he led one after another after another to the Lord until finally he's pastoring a church in prison of a hundred gang members. <laughs> Nestor had tried everything, absolutely everything, and it left him empty, unfulfilled, and he finds the pearl of great price. Miraculously, he was released from prison long before his sentence was over. And he went to find the pastor and told the pastor, I want to be your associate pastor. So he became a pastor, associate pastor of this little church. Today, Nestor has his own Pentecostal church. He's the pastor. And he says, only God could change a person like me. It doesn't matter how we find the Lord. It can be just fortunate by accident. It will cost us everything to follow in order to enjoy this news that's too wonderful for words. Or we found the Lord because our life was in such a mess, we just couldn't keep going. If you haven't found the Lord, today you hear a story. That's too good for words. It can change you in a moment. Just the bead of the power of the kingdom that comes from heaven can touch your life and change all things. You become a new creature. Or think back. How did you find the Lord? And celebrate. Celebrate a story that's too good for words. Pray with me. Lord, we are in your presence and we know you're always at work. You know every single person that's here. You know why they're here. You know if they have not even been thinking about you or their life is a mess. Either way, there is the treasure and the pearl that will transform completely, but it'll cost everything. And for many of us, we tend to forget how wonderful, how marvelous is your love. That we were lost, now we're found. And that you've lavished your grace upon us. Let us celebrate together. Pastor Kong's going to help me here. Man, praise God. Let's just give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Let's all stand out on our feet right now. How many of you want more the kingdom of God in our lives? Hallelujah. Let's just join hands across the aisle, shall we? With our neighbors on left and right. Jesus. The place of agreement is a place of power. Hallelujah. I want you to declare this out loud together with me. Say, in the name of Jesus, we want more of the kingdom of God. We want more of King Jesus. His rule and reign in our lives. The righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, I have found the treasure in the field, the pearl of great price. I want to give my whole life for the preaching of the gospel. Will you pray for your neighbors and your left and your right? Hallelujah. Oh God, we love you. We worship you. Thank you, Lord, for the treasure in the field. Thank you for the pearl of great price. Thank you for the kingdom of God you have brought us into. The rule and reign of the king. I just pray a little bit more for your neighbors on your left, on the right. Should you rule for you? Oh, I want to make room for you. Pastor, for a moment, the last four weeks, I, I really want to thank God for all the leaders, the staff, the board members in our church. You know, apart from the Easter weekend, that you have reached out and counseled literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of new converts. Many of you, in the last three weeks, you prayed for so many sick people, literally thousands of people. So, why don't we just give all our leaders a big clap for all their hard work, their love? I just sent this morning, what a privilege to have a tremendous man of God, Prof. Doug. You know, Prof. is, through Prof. and Sister Myrna, they have reached out to millions and millions of young people who in turn today are doing great things all over Latin America. Through his, he's not only a practitioner, he's a scholar. Through his scholarship, he has taught and raised up thousands of theologians. I think this morning, we want an impartation from Him. And I want, I want all of you, cell group leaders, ministry leaders, staff that's yet to be prayed for, board members, I want you to come quickly, just form a line. I want Prof to just lay hands upon you, give you an impartation that you too will reach out to your millions of people in our generation. Why don't we just give all our leaders a big clap. Cell group leaders, ministry leaders, PCGLs, Stuff that's yet to be prayed for, board members just come right now. Let's give them a big clap. Hallelujah. I will make room. I will make room.
just lift our hands, just begin to receive an impartation from the Lord wherever you're standing right now. Not only the leaders, but wherever you are, you can receive an impartation from the Holy Spirit today. The presence of God is all over this hall, all over this arena coming upon you, flowing into you, overwhelming you, flowing out of you, rivers of living water. Shuduria la carabaha de la la
worship the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Hallelujah. Surya la karabahade, la karabahade. Surya la karabahade, la karabahade, la 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 karabahade, la karabahude. Surya la karabahu, karabahade. Let's take a moment, just worship the Lord. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is here. your hearts to the Lord. The presence of God is here. Lift up your hands to Him. Just enjoy His presence. His love for you is so great. His perfect love casts out every fear. He's here to heal. He's here to renew. He's here to refresh. He's here to revive. He's here to restore. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Surya la kera bahare la kara bahare la kara bahare Surya la kera bahare la kara bahare Surya la kera bahare la kara bahare la kara bahare Surya la kera bahare la kara bahare Just take a moment to sing to the Lord a new song Surya la kera bahare la kara bahare Fall. 
such an anointing in this arena right now. One more time, can you just hold your neighbor's hands on your left and the right? Just pray for God's blessing just to come upon each one right now. Suduria la carabaha, dea 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 la la carabaha, dea la carabaha, dea la carabaha, dea so one last time we sing for We just give the Lord a big clap this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's write a big clap to the Lord. Hallelujah. What a wonderful presence. Hallelujah. How many of you can sense the love of the Lord in this room? This morning we want to, before we end, want to pray for Prof because uh, many of you may not realize Prof, this trip, he is, uh, he's been declared legally blind. So he, his eyesight now is not more than maybe a meter. So when he came and he preached, basically he's just preaching from memory. When he quoted the scripture, it's basically from memory. He can't really read right now. So he was teaching SOT, basically, <laughs> can you imagine all the lectures every day, four hours a day, purely from memory. Why don't we just give Prof a big clap right now. Amen. So I know when he goes back, he, he's going he's gonna to arrive in um, California on Thursday, and then he's going to see a doctor, either end of this week or early next week. He's going for another surgery, because a few months ago he had a surgery uh, to put a stent into his eye for his glaucoma but the surgery failed so we're just going to pray and you know when he preaches about the present the now and the not yet he's really speaking from experience he knows the power of God is here to heal but he just got to leave the outcome of that healing the miracle to the not yet and just trust God that whatever God plans out is going to be perfect for him so this is what faith is faith it's believing all the way to the end, regardless of the outcome. So we just want to pray for Prof. Pastor Iris, just lay hands on him. Jax, just lay hands. I'm going to ask, uh, the, uh, once again, I'm going to trouble uh, Pastor Eileen, who hates our intercessory ministry. Can we just all pray in tongues? Let's pray for Prof as he goes back. Father, you say in your word that words, Lord, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, Lord. Of the great things, O oh God, you, can, you have installed for us, for those who love you, Lord. Father, you truly love Prof, Dad, and Sister Amana, Lord, in a great way, O oh God, and eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Lord, the best truly is yet to be for them. Lord, we bless Prof, Dad, right now, Lord. Father, the blessing of God be upon him. Lord, we thank you, O oh God. What a great treasure he is to our church, to us, Lord, individually and corporately. Lord, he is truly, O oh God, truly, O oh God, a treasure to us. We pray and we release, O oh God, your presence your goodness over him. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, that, Lord, that you will protect him, O oh God, that he, as he goes into the surgery next week, Lord, we thank you, O oh God, that you go before him. 
Lord, that your power go before Him. Lord, your presence go before Him. Lord, there's nothing, O oh God, that you cannot do for Him, O oh God. For the greater days are ahead of Him, O oh God. Father, we thank you, O oh God, that truly, O oh God, that you'll bring take better and better. He will recover. He will do well, oh God, that the joy, the strength, Lord, will come back to Him, O oh God. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for prof that right now. Lord, we thank you, Lord, as we pray, O oh God. Father, your presence, O oh God, is running, is going. Lord, the goodness of God will overflow, Him, Lord, in a great measure. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, this surgery is going to be a great success. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, that you are going to go before us. You are going to go there, O oh God, and help Him, O oh God, in an hour, God. We bless Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give Jesus a big hand. Amen. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Prof, we believe. Total success. We're going to pray every single day. Total success. Stand will work. The fluid will drain out. Glaucoma, will, the index will subside. Uh, subside. And uh, not too low the pressure, so no internal bleeding. Not too high and no, no more double, triple, quadruple images. Right now, Prof is seeing like two, three, and all the images are jumping. So Prof, you're going to be clear. We need you for a long time. You're going to be clear in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. How many of you are glad we are one spiritual family? Yeah? We, we care for one another. We love one another. Before you go, will you just give somebody a big hug and say, the treasure is in you, and you are also the treasure to me. Can you say that? The treasure is in you, but you are also a treasure to me. God bless you. See you next week. David Samro, God bless.